I liked what Pastor Al said a while ago. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 Our, our boys, when they were growing up, little guys, they used to sing it this way. Oh, I was most incredibly happy when someone said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I like that. I didn't sing it right, but I like it anyway. <laughs> Well, it's good to be alive in Christ. Because yeah. anything else is dead, is death. Back in, just after, or just, just as Moses was about to go to his rest, he had commissioned Joshua and told him that what they need to do and how they would need to go to the River Jordan and have the priests that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant to step down into the water and move on into the Promised Land. They'd been 40 years to the day wandering in the wilderness. And that was after they had been 430 years to the day that God promised Abraham that your children will go down into Egypt and they will suffer there. They will be oppressed there. And then he says, but I, will, but I will judge the people who oppress them, and then I will bring them back. And he had told Abraham there in Genesis 15 that he was going to inherit this promised land where he was standing that day when God talked to him. And he was going to inherit the, that promised land, the land of the Ammonites. But he said, they have not filled the cup of their iniquity. He said, but you will come back. God knew that that society would reject him completely to the point where the children would have no hope of being able to know their creator and their God. And we're going to be looking at that some as the, as the days roll by and as the weeks pass here on Sabbath. So, there's the map, uh, uh, one of the maps of Joshua and Caleb's entry into uh, the promised land. They crossed the Jordan here and they went over and did battle with Jericho. And that's where Achan stole some gold and some fineries and wasn't supposed to get anything out of Jericho, but he buried it in the bottom of his tent and he wouldn't confess it and wouldn't admit it. And they had to cast lots and it fell on his tribe and finally on his family and finally on him and on his tent. God was leading his people to be faithful and to obey him. The interesting thing is most people think that was a different God in the Old Testament than the one we have in the New Testament. But the fact is, in, in Hebrews 13, the Bible declares Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Paul says it was Jesus that was with them in the wilderness before they went into the promised land. He said he was the pillar of cloud by day. And he was the fire by night. Jesus was there. He was the rock. He was the one that spoke. God always speaks through his word, Jesus. And that's exciting. And people don't like that, that Jesus. They, they, they make a new Jesus. And in the, uh, in the 21st century, we have a new Jesus. We have a different Jesus than what the Bible portrays. And it's, it's very interesting what is about to happen that is going to reveal that he definitely is the same. Here's a picture of the Jordan River and its flood stages, and that's exactly when they crossed the river, is each year it would flood. When the snows were melting, and it would run off and flood. And, and I've been to Spokane, Washington, that's eastern Washington, and all the snows are melting. It's end of March, April, and sometimes into May, and those, those, that river is, wow, it's an amazing thing to go see. Anybody ever seen that river in Spokane? Oh man, it's beautiful. It's the great Northwest. It's worth seeing. If you go, go in the springtime so you can see that river. And I've, uh, I've walked through that river when it wasn't in flood stage, but uh, and here's another picture of the Jordan River. Here's a picture of, of what an artist's depiction of what it looked like. Now, anybody ever tried to walk through a river when it's in flood stage and when the, when the water's running fast? Anybody ever done that? Well, I've done it and regretted it. I've left blood in the river before, getting knocked down. And this one was only, it was about that deep that day. 
And I thought I could walk through it. And that water was moving. And water's powerful. And it knocked me down. And, and I've had it happen twice. I don't think I'm going to cross any more rivers until I get to heaven. <laughs> and, and so these guys are carrying the Ark of the Covenant in. And the waters pile up. Just like God said they would. On the banks of the River Jordan. I believe that the same God who told them to step out by faith, to move over to possess the promises of God, is the same God that's telling us we need to step out by faith each day and go out and possess the land for God. And what I mean is go out and, and plant the gospel everywhere your feet carry you. It's not, God didn't say go and make disciples. That's what it says in the English. But in the Greek he says, as you are going, make disciples. God knows you're going to be going somewhere. You're not going to just park it and camp out and stay at home because you got to go see the, the Dodgers or somebody. You got to go watch the, the Rams or you got to do something. You got to go do something. He knows you're going to go. So he says there, as you are going, wherever you go, talk about Jesus. And that's how easy it is to make disciples. Jesus said, if I be lifted up. Now, he was talking about his crucifixion, but there's a double meaning. If you mention Jesus Christ, the Spirit will always honor you. He will always bear witness of your testimony about Jesus. So it's so easy to make disciples. You just talk about Jesus and the Spirit does all the work. In fact, the Spirit's the one that gives you the courage and the skill and the bravery to even talk about Jesus. So it's really what Jesus said it was. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Man, I like that because I worked so hard by the time I was 18, I was done working. I'd rather watch him work. Amen? Amen. I'd rather enjoy letting him work through me. Right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. I see a few heads shaking. Deuteronomy 27. Now Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people saying, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you guys. If you're taking notes and if you want to, a, a, a lady said, hey, we need to have notepad, note sheets. So I put some note sheets out there in that little round table so you can take notes if you want to take notes. And uh, you should because it's the word of God. If it's something I come up with, you don't need to take notes on that. But if it's something he's got, you definitely need to be checking that out more often. Now Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people saying, keep all the commandments which I command you today and it shall be on the day when you cross over the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God is giving you that you shall set up for yourselves large stones, memorial stones, and whitewash them with lime. You shall write on them all the words of this law when you have crossed over that you may enter the land which the Lord your God is giving you. A land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord God of your fathers promised you. Therefore it shall be, when you have crossed over the Jordan, that on Mount Ebal, the Mount of Blessing, you shall set up these stones which I command you today, and you shall whitewash them with lime. And there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not use an iron tool on them. The altar of stones that you get from the middle of the river as a testimony that God really did drive back the water and you were there and you pulled those rocks right out of the river. Now, how are they going to know those rocks are out of the middle of the river? How are they going to know that? They're so smooth. You ever been river rock hunting? Man, they're as smooth as smooth can get. And you find those rocks in the middle of the river. And anybody, oh, those people didn't do that. They just got those rocks over here on the riverbank. Oh, no, they didn't. Look how smooth they are. For, for decades and perhaps hundreds of years, that testimony was there. And it was a big testimony because not only that, all the spies from Jericho and IE and, and those other towns, they were, in, they were just freaking out. They were in shock as they saw this happen because the spies were there. They'd heard about these guys walking around for 40 years. They'd heard about this God that was so serious and so real about what he, what he wanted his, his servants to do that when they didn't do it, he led them through the wilderness until they all died. That's a pretty serious God. 
A lot of people think that wasn't Jesus, but it was. And soon, during the time of trouble, there will be no question about whether or not he's still the same now as he was in Egypt and as he was in Canaan. It's going to get real serious real fast. And he said, don't put man-made stuff here. Just put what I've done here as a testimony that I am the Lord who leads you. You shall build with whole stones the altar of the Lord your God and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. You shall offer peace offerings and shall eat there and rejoice before the Lord your God. We talked about presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. The way, the way Solomon presented 22,000 bulls. And I made a mistake last week. I said it was 22,000 rams. It was 122,000 rams. And people say, oh, that's a mistake. They couldn't, uh, there must be a problem in the... No, yes, it was the way it was. And I'll tell you right now, two and a half to three million people crossed that river with, Jos with Joshua. Started to say Josiah. With Joshua. That's fun. Our little grandson, Josiah, he's a kick. And uh, he loves singing. And I love singing to him. And, and so does Esper. And everybody does. But we sing to him. Josiah was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Instead of Zacchaeus, we sing Josiah. And then, I, and then the one, uh, he likes that. And he laughs and he chuckles when he hears that song. And then if he's, if he's fussy... And he's kind of irritated, cutting teeth or something like that. Uh, the song that he really obsesses on, he really enjoys, and he likes to listen to is uh, Old MacDonald Had a Farm. But I sing it, Young Josiah Had a Farm. E -I -E -I -O, and he likes that. He likes it when I say Josiah. So isn't it exciting what God does? It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. That's part of being a living sacrifice, is being joyful. And, and, and being, the Lord wants us to be victorious in life. Amen? Amen? And so the Lord's called us to lay it all on the altar. The altar of heaven at the throne of grace. To lay it all there every morning. Man, that's one of the most exciting things a human being can do. Is every day, every morning, come boldly to the throne of the universe the throne of grace, and say, Father, I place all that I am, all that I have, and all that I shall ever be on the altar of heaven at your throne of grace. Don't you know he loves to hear that? Because he loves to save us. And the only way he can save us is if we give him all. Amen. Amen. It's, so, it's so awesome. That's what he's talking about here. Do it all. And you shall write very plainly Make it very plain about my law. Make it so clear that everybody knows what I'm telling you sin is. Make it so clear that everybody knows that, what I, how, that I'm telling you how to be saved. Make it so clear that anyone could understand it, even little children. Now, now the world that's listening to the devil... They're doing everything they can to fog it up and cloud it up and make it all mixed up and it's not clear about what sin is anymore. But the Bible is very clear. And when you, write, when you write somebody, when you write it down or when you speak for God, you need to do it very clear. Make it very clear. Make it very, very clear. Plain. Make it very plain. Plainly on the stones. All the words of this law. Now, a lot of people say, well, what law is that? Well, that's all the law of the universe. Every law. Any law God shows you. If, if God shows you a, a, a law and you decide you're not going to walk in it anymore, you may end up flatter than a pancake. If God, if God reveals, say you're, say you're seven or eight years old. And you become aware of the law of gravity and you decide you're not going to obey that law anymore. Or you're going to be Superman and jump off your house, your roof. That you're Superman. You got a cape on the whole deal. And you can jump off that and that law of gravity ain't got nothing on you. You the man or you the woman, Wonder Woman or whoever. And you jump off that, that house, you're liable to get a broken nose. I'm glad I didn't break mine when I did that. But isn't it so awesome that God winks at our ignorance? Amen? Oh, let me tell you. And it doesn't stop when you're a little boy or a little girl. 
I was, we added on an addition to our house when we lived in Keene, Texas. And it, these, in Keene, Texas, they got these huge, steep, real high, steep roofs. The pitch is amazing. You'd think it snows there or something. It hardly ever snows there. But they've got the, and the reason is it gets so hot in Texas, you need to have somewhere where the heat to go, and it's way up high in your attic. If you have a low attic, that heat just, whoo, down against the floor of your, of your living room. So they build these real high roofs. And I was adding this on, we had this, and I was putting the last nail into the sheathing, you know, the, the roofing, the sheathing, and I had this big, big giant framing air gun. I should have had a small, smaller gun, but I was using my big one. And I was hanging on to the, what do you call that, the gable, the top, hanging on, the rib, the ridge, yeah, the ridge, yeah. I'm just a rookie. So I'm hanging on to that thing, and I'm, I had to reach around because I didn't want to get, the, I didn't have a ladder long enough. So I'm hanging on to that thing. And you know that, that sheathing is real slippery. It's real, it's, it's slippery, slippery. And I'm hanging on there. And I don't have any gloves on because it's slippery if you have gloves. So I'm just hanging on. And I had to reach way over to get that last nail. It went, thump. And that thing, those things are powerful. It's a big one with the big, the big chamber. Thump. And it pulled me back enough. Whoo! I slipped off that thing. And I was on my way down. And I was, I don't know, 45 feet up. That, that thing was high. And I'm headed down fast like this with my face against the building. I thought, that's not going to work. So I rolled around real quick. And I'm looking. And I'm going fast. And I remember there's a sawhorse down there. In fact, there's two sawhorses. And that's not good. And I remember, so I put my hands down to try to stop myself, and I burned blisters on both hands. That's not working. So I let that go, and I was picking up speed. And if you think God's angels do not camp around about those who fear him, you've never been on top of a Texas roof. <laughs> and it had a little skirt thing on it. The roof didn't go straight down. It had a little skirt thing that launched me. When I hit it, I launched. I was wearing my baseball hat. And as I launched, my hat just kind of softly went off. Like slow motion, David was down there watching me. He goes, what is dad doing? I, I know he's crazy, but why is he doing this? He thought I was doing it on purpose. And I, I'm telling you right now, my shirt tail grazed that, 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 that step, that uh, sawhorse was sitting like this. And I was coming right on it, and, and, my, and my shirt tail grazed the end of that sawhorse. And I hit going fast. I hit and whew, and whew, like that, like a feather. There had to be angels there holding me up that day. That, that is real. And I believe that. So if you defy the laws of nature and the law, any law, you better hope that the grace of God is there. And it is, it is, it is for those who believe. In Hebrews 11, as we, as we think about where we're at, now, I forgot to tell you guys last week, people that have problems or a struggle with their morning time with God, uh, Bible study, prayer life, and that, that would include all the human race because we all have a struggle. The, the flesh is weak. We're just like Peter, James, and John. They kept falling asleep that night when Jesus was praying and he asked them to pray. They kept falling asleep. Well, in the Navy, when I was in boot camp, if you fell asleep, say it was the third week of boot camp, if you fell asleep in class, guess what? You get kicked right back to a new company to the first day of boot camp again. And if you go seven, eight weeks of boot camp and you fall asleep in the eighth week, you go again back to that first week. I tell you what, you, you, you learn how to stay awake. And, I, and I, you get up, you get up and you, go, you stand up in the back of the class so you don't fall asleep. And if you have to, you get a soda or you get a two before to stand on or something to stand on so that you have to balance yourself so that you won't fall asleep. We've got to stay awake. It's not worth risking falling asleep. We must stay awake. A guy knew. He decided he was going to beat the thing. He said, okay, Lord, I keep falling asleep on you. So his prayer life moved to the bathroom on the edge of the bathtub. He would stand on the bathtub edge and pray. He never fell asleep again while he was praying. Now that's a good thing. You do what you have to do, whatever the Spirit tells you. Something that I have found that, that really keeps me wide awake is I sing often in my prayers. 
I sing throughout my prayers. Off and on, I'll stop and sing. And I'll sing, I'll sing, I'll sing, you know. Uh, and not now I lay me down to sleep type songs. I'm talking about singing faith songs and, and victorious songs. And sing them. Sing them to the living God. And, and that helps stay awake. And also pray the promises of God. In your prayers, repeat the promises of God. Speak the promise, confess, declare the promises of God in your prayers. That stimulates the soul. That'll keep you awake. That's a really good way to do that. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now this verse is one of the easiest verses to become a Pharisee with. And that is if you go run out and say, man, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to be diligent, and man, I'm going to kick this thing, and I'm going to show the devil how powerful I am, and I'm going to make this happen, you're done. If you do that, you're done. But if you read that and you say, okay, God, I hear what you're telling me to do, but unless you give me the power of your amazing grace, it will never happen. And unless you continue giving me that amazing grace every day, this is not going to happen in my life. So, Father, according to your word, you make it happen, and we'll all be happy, and I will see you face to face someday in heaven. That's the only answer to this. We've got to do it that way. If there's any New Year's resolution, it's, I will do all things through Christ, as he instructs me and as he leads me. But seek him diligently. Seek him diligently. And that's faith. That's a faith act. In Revelation 14, 12, and we're talking about crossing over into a new realm. And, and I believe we have to, I, I don't know about you, but I have to cross Jordan every day, every morning. Until I see Jesus, I'm going to have to deal with that wilderness that's in my soul called the sinful nature, that old, harsh, life-killing wilderness called the sinful nature. And I believe I need to leave that sinful nature behind every day. It's called dying daily. I die daily, Paul said. And Jesus said, unless you take up your cross each day and come out to me, you can't be mine. The cross is all about crucifixion, dying. So I believe the patient endurance of the saints... Is, is the keeping of the commandments of, of God through the faith of Jesus. Now, if you try it any other way, it's not going to happen. And, and it's so real. Would you want anybody else's faith other than Jesus? I wouldn't. Now, I've, I played college football. We played against the University of Texas back when they used to win national championships. They still do once in a while. But I remember this guy played for them and he was six foot I don't know about six foot and 255 pounds his first name was Earl anybody remember who he is Earl Campbell he looked like a big bull he was about that wide and he ran like the wind he was bigger than a house, and he ran like the wind. If you tried to tackle him head on, he would punish you. I saw my buddy, Earl was 255, my buddy was 255. I was watching, and I was glad I was watching. And Earl came flying over this side, and this guy said, uh, he, man, he launched over here, and they hit head on, and my poor friend, Mac, Mac, when Earl hit him, he went flying through the air on his back. Boom. Landed on his back about three or four yards back. Earl just shook his head and kept going for a touchdown. It was mind-blowing. And, and I'm going to tell you something. If you think that you can stop the devil from destroying your life without hiding behind Jesus Christ, he will run over you. Just like he ran, just like Earl Campbell ran over my buddy that day. 
and he will stomp on you as he runs by you. Now, Earl didn't do that because he was a good sport. But one other time, I, we were playing against the team, and this big, big running back, he wasn't as big as Earl, but he was big, and I happened to be in his way that day, which was not a good thing. And I tried to hit him and bring him down, and he knocked me on my back. And as he went by, he didn't go by, he ran right over the top of me, and he slowed down just a little bit so he could stomp on me a few more times. And then he kept going. That was upsetting. So I got up. So if the devil knocks you down, don't you stay down. I got up, and man, I got my eyes on him. And he was dodging all the defensive backs and the cornerbacks and the linebackers. And he was waving and waving and trying to get to the uh, touchdown. I said, no, sorry, buddy. And I trailed him and I tracked him. And they were bouncing off of him like, he wasn't even, like they weren't even there. I mean, these guys were just bouncing. This guy was headed. And I came in behind him and I hit him right in the back. Boom. I planted his face. Boom. Right in the mud. Amen. He rolled over, he rolled over, and he looked at me and he goes, oh, you. And I go, yeah, me. And I got up and I, I didn't stomp on him like he did me. But you gotta, be, you gotta be in this thing. You can't lay down when the devil knocks you down. You can't still there and stay there and, oh, I wonder why God let that happen to me. Or, I wonder why God didn't help me get up. Well, he's trying to help you get up. But you're listening to that other garbage. God says, get up again. He says, get up, I'll help you. Let's go, let's get up, let's go, let's go. And if you can't hear him saying that, then, then you, need to, you need to spend more time with somebody who can hear him saying that. Do you hear what I just said? If you can't hear him telling you, get up, let's go, let's get this done. If you can't hear him saying that, then you need to start hanging around people who, who, are, who do hear him. And, and it's obvious that they hear him. And let's get her done. Amen? Amen? Wow. You know, I bought a motorcycle about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. It was a Kawasaki 650 Dual Sport. I think it was a six-speed. I don't know. Do they make six-speeds? Yeah. It was a six-speed. That thing was so powerful. It was like a rocket. And it was more powerful than I could handle. And then my son got on it one day, and he ran it up to about 110 mile an hour on a dirt road. I sold it the next day. <laughs> so I may, I may, can, can you wear one of those things if you don't own a motorcycle? Okay. They won't, they won't make too much fun of me. All right. Because I like those, I, I like those motorcycles, that, especially Jesus number one. And then that thing on the back. Man, stand up, Terry. I got to look at that again. That is so beautiful. Look at that. Sabbath Keepers Motorcycle Ministry, Seventh-day Adventist. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. And Revelation 14 is on there. Well, that happened to be where we were. Here is the pay. Here's how you're going to win this thing. Here's, the, here's how you can endure through the struggles and through the heartaches and through the problems that come our way. It, it, it's going to be, it's gonna be by, by cherishing. The word keep there means cherish. It means cherish and value. It's not talking about performance. Because if it's talking about performance, we might as well just go and party hardy until it's all done and we're dead. Because you can't get there on your performance. This is talking about your heart. Your choice, your desires. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting my soul. The commandments of the Lord are pure, making wise the simple. Cherishing, valuing every word that comes from the mouth of God. Through the faith of Jesus. By, having, by receiving the faith of Jesus. Just go to the Father and say, Father, I'm here to get everything you gave Jesus. I'm here to get every, I'm here to get the pure, holy, awesome, mighty, powerful, all-wise faith of Jesus. 
And here's evidence right here. From his own mouth. I like it. Revelation 14, 12. John 14, 12. If you want to get it, if you want to find out how real this battle is, go to Isaiah 14, 12. But we're not going there today. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus said, most assuredly, vehemently, intensely, uh, incredibly, please hear what I'm saying. It's absolute. I say to you, he who believes, he who, he who clings to me, he who places his life on me, the works that I do, he will do also. He or she, either one. And greater works. Are you, are you serious? Wait a minute. So I'm going to do the works he did, and in greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Wow. That's off the scale. Now that's what he said, and the next verse is cool. I don't have it up there, but the next verse is, it tells you how, why, how this is going to happen. He says, because I'm going to be at the Father's throne praying for you. Can't ask for anything more than that. And here's what John's testimony was about it. But as many as received Jesus, it's so easy. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. All you have to do every day is receive Jesus. And that's so easy. I say, Father, I, I'm here to receive Jesus. Done. That's how easy that is. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the authority, the power to become children of God to those who live in Jesus. I like that. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and opens, I will come in to him and we're going to hang out together. That's what that means. We're going to dine together. We're going to live together. We're going we're to cohabitate. I'm going to live inside of you. We're going to become one. Amen. Amen. And, and it, it, if you don't hear Jesus knocking, it may be because you've been ignoring it too long. That's true. But I know that each day I must do this because it's a daily dying, it's a daily cross. Uh, when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, that pastor told me, it's actually in the baptismal vow, how that, how that you're making a commitment to spend time and develop a devotional, a daily devotional life. I thought, well, sure, why not? You know, yeah, I agree to that. <laughs> I found out pretty soon it was a lot more difficult to do than it was to say. Anybody hear what I'm talking about? Yeah. Now, it's exciting to see the church this full. It is. You know, us humans, we need to be encouraged, right? I mean, how long would you go to a church if the church only had four people attending and it had this many pews? Now, there's some, tough, there's some tough soldiers out there that can handle that, but not very many people can handle that. And um, I remember one of the first times I ever preached in a church, not the first, but one of the first times, a guy, he was an oil well driller, and he couldn't, he was a lay pastor, and, he, and I was young, I was real young, 21, 20, 21. And he said, I can't go to my church to do prayer meeting tonight, could you do that? And I go, sure, yeah. And, and I thought the church would be full. You know, I'd never been to this church, but I thought, well, it'd probably be, I mean, this guy's an awesome guy. He loves the Lord, probably has a cool church. <laughs> I went to the church, and at prayer meeting time, there was two people, and I was the third. And it was a, an elderly couple in their 80s, 90s. The lady was, she couldn't hear. She literally could not hear. And her husband slept the whole time. And I had a message like you couldn't believe. 
man, did I have a message because I was ready to tell them, tell them about Jesus. Give it to them. Start a revival. Shake the world for God. And I got there and it was time to start and there was only two. And he was already asleep before we started. And she couldn't hear. But I remembered something an old time missionary told me one time. He said, Paul, he said, whenever you stand up for Jesus, you preach for heaven. And you preach for anybody who might be hearing. He says, and you preach as if the house is full. Don't you get discouraged. Don't you let people's uh, neglect or uh, negligence, don't you let, don't you get discouraged because people aren't supporting whatever God's doing. You preach as though the house is full. Amen. The Holy Spirit reminded me of that. And man, I preached a sermon and nobody heard it except me, the crickets, the mice, and whoever may have been walking down the sidewalk by the church that night. And Jesus. And Jesus. But he tested me that night. And if I had just done some halfway thing, just done a halfway deal, well, she can't hear me and he's asleep, blah, 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 blah. Let's go home. I know that God watches to see whether or not he can promote us to the next level. And he's watching every morning to see who he can promote. To see who he can elevate. To see who, who he can tell more information to. To see who he can lead to a higher level, a higher plane. He's watching to see if he can do that for you. But if you don't take care of the first basic elementary grade school stuff, he'll never be able to promote you to the next level. It's not that, you know, God's not keeping score so he can call you out and send you to the dugout. He's watching to see whether or not you're going to let him lift you up to the next level. So we're on the banks of the river every morning. And, and we get tired of doing the same thing over and over and over. We get, we, get, we get bored if we have to do the same thing. A lot of humans, we get tired of that. But I want to tell you something. If you get tired of coming before the, the, the creator of the universe and ask him to renew his salvation in your soul every morning. If that, if that is not exciting enough for you, then you and I need to have a talk. It's the most exciting thing you could ever do. Is to meet him at the throne of grace. And engage that cross of Calvary. Take hold of Jesus. And have that new experience. Sean is going to come and sing a song right now. And may God bless us as we hear this testimony from this beautiful song. It should be. It's the yellow mic. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say as we, as we are allowing God to move us to the next levels in our life in this new year that you might not always, it might not always be easy. And you might be standing at that river, at that bank. And just know that no matter what, you have to declare in Jesus' name that he's going to fight that battle for you. You have to say that I already have the victory because I'm not going through this river by myself. I'm going with Jesus. So this song, God actually brought it back to me last night. And I haven't heard it in years. And it's actually a song about 10 years ago when I was in nursing school, brought me through nursing school, through every exam, every test. And now that I hear it now, it, I hope that it blesses you as well. to you what this means 
seems to me that you will leave your throne above the clouds to come and talk to me. So much has been going on that I don't understand. But when the weight seems so heavy, I listen closely. I'll hear you say, I'll fight your battles. I'll hear you say, you are not alone. Oh my God, hold me close to your heart and breathe life into my soul oh now i can look back and i remember oh, your faithfulness to me always the same take my hand walk me through this journey so my life will bring glory to your name, yes. Oh Lord, we declare, Lord, we declare, you'll fight our battles. Lord, we declare, your blood has overcome. already given and we sing glory to your name yeah you fight our battles thank you Jesus not in my power, but in your power, only by the blood, victory. You're so awesome, yes, you're wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. You can sing with me. Lord, we declare, you'll fight our battles. Lord, we your blood has overcome. Victory is already given. And we sing glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 How many of you want Jesus to fight your battles? And you want to follow him and hide behind him? Amen. He is a... He, actually, the proverb says he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother, but he's also our big brother. So we get everything in Jesus. I'd like to invite you to stand as we close in prayer. And just there in the in the silence of your own heart and your own mind, just, just say yes to Jesus, however you do that. It's, it's so unique and he's so beautiful. He, he loves to hear us say yes to Jesus, however we say it. That's one of the most exciting things God can ever experience is when a, a lost soul or a, a helpless sinner like you and I, when we just... Wake up every morning and say, yes, we, we still want Jesus. Yes, take care of us today because we can't take care of ourselves. We need to humble ourselves and admit that we do need Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I can't imagine what it was like for Joshua and Caleb and those two and a half or three million Israelites the river was swollen, 
flood stages and you told them to walk across. And the only ones that were alive who'd seen it happen coming out of Egypt was Joshua and Caleb. Nobody else had seen the Red Sea, that amazing miracle. And by your grace, they all followed the Spirit. I pray, Father, for each one of us here today and for anybody listening by internet or, or even hearing about Jesus anywhere that we'd, we'd know, we'd have that assurance given to us by you that Jesus will lead us safely through every day no matter what comes against us. We can follow Jesus. Even if death swallows any of us up, we can close our eyes in death, knowing Jesus has already been there and he's there already to catch us and to raise us when the time comes. We love you, Lord. Thank you for creating us to be able to love you. And thank you for creating us to be able to receive your love. Teach us. Empower us. Lead us to those who do not know your love. And may they experience your love through us is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you go. Jesus is coming back.